Hello, I'm Federico Ast. I am president of the Cooperative Cleros and welcome to how to build in Web3. Um, this course will teach you the main elements to, to build a project in the Web3 ecosystem. So in 2021, we launched the Cleros Incubator to support a number of, of teams building in the, in the ecosystem. Uh, this is a three month program that takes place in, in Lisbon. Uh, this is one of the workshops, uh, what it looks like. And in this incubator, um, well, people uh, do a number of workshops about strategy, about user research, customer discovery. And basically for this incubator, we just um, formalized all of the tools that we use ourselves to, to well, build our products. And um, so, one day we said, okay, why don't we just open source all of this content uh, and then uh, put them for the community? And so that's how this, this course was, was born, um, about how to build in Web3, the first course by the Cleros Academy. And uh, <clears throat> over a number of sessions, you will see a number of <clears throat> different elements that uh, are important for, for building a, a Web3 project. Uh, and this will cover a number of different things that are typically not maybe uh, seen by people who are focusing on the uh, technical elements, right? <coughs> so this program is a program for people who already know blockchain. It's, this is not for beginners. They, you have to know what the DAO is, how blockchains work, and a number of elements um, about uh, the industry. And also that you want to start building a project in in the in the space. So and it's also a non-technical pro, uh, program. So this is not going to teach you how to build a, an app. Uh, but if you are a technical person and you need to have all of the different elements that you have to put together to to put a project in 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 motion. So this is uh, the great um, program for for you. Okay. So let's let's get started. And first we'll just um, make some introduction to the Web3 ecosystem of what we call the blockchain revolution. And for this, let's um, go back in time a bit to the early days of the of the World Wide Web. Um, so in the early 90s, uh, the Internet was seen as a tool for progress. It was a um, tool for democratization and uh, where anyone with a computer could access uh, the world information, anyone could publish a blog and reach a world audience. You could sell stuff on, on e-commerce and reach, you know, uh, customers all around the world. But then this promise was broken. Um, and this gentleman you see on the screen is called Jaron Lanier, and he has this book um, called Who Owns the Future? So Jaron Lanier is he's one of the main um, developers of virtual reality in the 1980s, and then he became a very critical person of all the Silicon Valley I mean, establishment of the internet. And he calls the big tech companies, um, what he calls them um, like siren servers, uh, like sirens as the um, old mythological creatures of, of ancient Greece that um, had this very seductive um, uh, sing, uh, and singing and they attracted sailors. And then when they were not far from the island where they live, they just attack them and, and aid them. So big tech uh, companies are like siren servers in the sense that they lure us and attract us with their offer of free services. Um, and then when we are in their ecosystem, they kind of eat us or <laughs> kill us and take all of, all, all of our data in exchange for those like free services. Um, so as they say in Silicon Valley, if you're not paying for the product, then you are the product. And all of the Web2 internet was built uh, on a very similar architecture, which is you have uh, users on one side and people, users on the other, some, some produce something, uh, a service, and the other consume it. And then in the middle, you have this siren server that intermediates all the transactions and take you know, um, a cut of all of the money that flows in this, uh, in this network. So you have YouTube connects uh, producers of content with consumers of content, Uber connects producers of rides with the consumers of rides and Airbnb the same with guests and hosts. And well, Facebook is the big, you know, um, uh, siren server that connects everything with everyone. And we don't even know what the, the company does actually. Um, um, so they, 
because system has so many things and so many people. So, and this is a very important, um, you know, Siren server of the current architecture of the internet, right? So important thing to remember is that the web two internet was built with this type of architecture. You have users on the sides and you have a server, a centralized server in the middle, and this server can um, intermediate all of the transactions happening with, between all of those users. <clears throat> so then, came the blockchain revolution. So this starts in um, 2008, uh, in the middle of the crisis uh, of the, well, Lehman Brothers, Supreme and all the financial collapse. In that moment, you, as you know, Satoshi Nakamoto publishes the paper of Bitcoin proposing uh, a new type of currency based on this new technology of databases called blockchain. And then, <clears throat> In 2014, then there is the launch of Ethereum, uh, which brings again the logic of blockchain, but with more sophisticated smart contract logic that you can in enable into the contracts. And this helps um, put a number of business logics, uh, write these business logics into the smart contracts. And then all of what is written there is going to be executed as coded into the Ethereum uh, network for Ethereum or other blockchains that have smart contract capabilities. Uh, of course, Ethereum is currently the, the most important one. So <clears throat> a number of ideas that we need to, to understand so we see how blockchain is evolving and how the Web3 uh, market is going to evolve. First, um, this really good piece written by uh, Chris Berniski and Joel Monigro called Open standards, market cycles, and investment returns. This is the thesis that they have at, at their VC fund uh, placeholder. And it sees Web3 as a um, new stage of uh, a process that is moving from closed standards to open standards in a number of different industries. Uh, in the case of IBM, they were leaders in mainframe computers, and then they were disrupted by the open source hardware computer by the invention of microprocessors. Then came the monopoly of Microsoft uh, and proprietary software, which was disrupted by open source software. And now we are in the middle of um, the dominance of um, the private data networks uh, embodied by um, Google or Facebook. And then the open source network response to this is the idea of Web3 and crypto networks. It is uh, the freeing of data and putting data in an open source um, manner, right? So all of these applications that are being currently built in the Web3 are meant to open um, to break a number of um, data monopolies that exist in the Web2 era. And the process is probably going to happen through a number of sta stages, like four stages, um, according to the um, placeholder thesis, which they take from an um, economist uh, from Venezuela called Carlota Perez, who developed a very thorough um, well, research about how different industries evolve since the 18th century and the canals in the UK. So uh, she sees that um, a new technology comes with a phase of er eruption, then comes a mania phase with financial bubbles and all that. Then there is a market crash and then we have a, a period of synergy and consolidation, which um, is when the technology starts to, well, give us the improvements that it promised. And so that is how the technology starts to be deployed and have its impact on, on the economy and society. So this is an important thing to have in mind. <coughs> Another important thesis to understand the Web3 ecosystem is the protocol sync thesis that was uh, developed by Ryan Sean Adams from Bankless. And uh, this uh, is based uh, on an understanding of how the uh, Web3 stack works. Um, as a number of layers. At the bottom, you have Ethereum uh, that provides decentralized computing to all of the applications built on top. And then you have a combination of different um, apps that can be combined into other apps that are user facing and that can provide better services to users. And all of these are open source and decentralized. So the um, protocol sync thesis predicts that the higher the density of a protocol, the deeper it will be in the protocol stack, and then the higher the potential for, for adoption. So as Ethereum 
is a very uh, generic protocol. It can have lots of different things on top of it. Um, and so the big question is, okay, uh, how does uh, one uh, see what the protocol density is and how can you improve it? So you have this formula so that says that the protocol density depends on two things, the utility and divided by the attack surface, right? So uh, utility is about how valuable and the protocol uh, is for users and what is the value proposition it gives for people who want to use it. Um, the attack surface is about uh, how a protocol can be captured or coerced or, or corrupted in order to favor some groups over, over others. So <clears throat> generally speaking, the, the strategy to implement would be uh, try to increase the protocol density through two general type of um, decisions. One is increase the utility of the protocol and the other one is try to decrease the attack surface. Okay. <clears throat> so another interesting question is why, why should this be decentralized? I mean, and why this matters? Uh, um, and for, for this, it's very important that you read the, this, I would say famous piece by Chris Dixon on why decentralization matters. And in this um, article, he has this thesis of how um, the Web2 platforms tend to behave in connection to users. So they, he finds that um, Web2 companies, they have this um, behavior of an S-shaped curve, where the first thing that they try to do is to attract users to their ecosystem and try to grow as fast as possible and to start um, having network effects so they can beat the competition. But after some point where they have already established themselves as leaders, they start to um, ex extract resources from the users um, by like taxing them or ha collecting high fees for using the platform or users in the sense of like final users or also all of the developers that have built their applications on, on top of, of the of the company network. And this was very clear, for example, <clears throat> when, when Facebook um, did changes into how third party developers could access their uh, platform or when Twitter basically um, decided that nobody could have an interface on the Twitter network besides themselves and they just killed all of the other third party companies that um, had been betting on, on building interfaces for, for Twitter. So um, this idea uh, is that um, these platforms can uh, just by a decision by the management change the rules when, when they want and this can have very strong impacts on their users and the developers of the ecosystem. So this is why a very important concept of uh, Web3 is the idea of credible neutrality that is described by Vitalik in this article um, where he explains that um, credible neutral protocol is built on rules that doesn't benefit some users uh, over others in an arbitrary way. So this means that the users cannot change you know, rules arbitrarily and that these rules need to be created um, through some governance process on which every user uh, should have a say and the chance to, to vote, which is not the case in Web2. And in some way, it's like a transition from the idea of a, a monarchy where you have a king that uh, decides the policies and decides um, the, the laws and everything, and he has the central power for everything, to a republic where you have rules and you have uh, procedures and ways to do things that are defining some constitution and and this is gives you know uh, citizens the ability of influence the public policies um, this is in some way uh, what web3 is bringing to the world of the of the internet <clears throat> so this new structure of of, of, of the, the protocols um, gives us the hope that um, they will behave uh, in a way that we call minimally extractive coordinators. So they will be protocols that coordinate a number of economic activities. And uh, as they start to grow and become massive, they won't show the same S type of, of curve shape that uh, Web2 uh, networks seem to, to have. Because um, people who are um, the users are also the owners of the network. So they will still have the incentive not to 
um, extract rents from themselves. So, uh, um, and this is um, what we expect to happen when Web3 protocols become, become massive. And this also brings a, a very important uh, way, uh, a change in the way in which these protocols are governed because these are ruled by the community and this kind of um, new um, coming of uh, the cooperative um, type of enterprises that were very common in the past and many companies still um, are structured as cooperatives and the idea of crypto networks uh, is that lots of users can be partners in a cooperative and be under economic incentives generated by, by tokens and this is what we call decentralized business models um, so in the materials you have lots of uh, readings uh, and videos you can watch to learn more about web3 movement so your homework for now is to well dive into to those materials and try to learn as much as possible uh, about the web3 movement and then uh, after you feel comfortable with that then we can move to the next uh, lesson that is going to be strategy design See you. Thank you.